You know, I was forewarned when I came out here about this pit in front of the stage, you know, <laughs> in the hopes that uh, looking down from a great height didn't disturb me while I spoke. It's really a pleasure to be able to join you here this evening and to share some thoughts and ideas with you. I've been informed that you've had a long series of weeks leading up to this particular moment, and at this particular week and uh, continuing, you will be having the technological stories given to you in great depth. I think most of you will recall the story of the fellow who took a speed reading course and was so proud of his accomplishment and he said, I read Tolstoy's War and Peace in 20 minutes. And he said it was about Russia. <laughs> now, confronted with a massive volume of technical information on the environment that is being unfolded these days, spurred by the National Teach-In, I feel uh, just a little like that speed reader this evening. Although I have been a practicing conservationist for many years, I find the scope and sophistication of this nation awakening both exciting and sometimes awesome. Frankly, in the last three or four years, I have wished we could awaken the nation this easily on some other subjects. Now, fortunately, you don't have to be a professional ecologist to share a piece of the action. And what you need are an awareness, an overview, and a deep personal commitment. Obviously, you who are here tonight have all these qualities in depth. You also bring together the combined knowledge of various professional and academic disciplines, resources that are essential to any degree of success in meeting such a major problem of our society as the environmental crises. I consider the environmental teach-in one of the most important and significant movements of our time. I'm extremely proud and grateful to be a part of your Earth Day program here tonight. A year ago at this time, students by the hundreds of thousands throughout this great country of ours were active in demonstrations and in protest movements throughout the breadth of the land. It was not just the hardcore revolutionary minority involved. It was the vast majority of young people who were seeking nonviolent change to improve our society. I was saying at that time on various campuses that I was reassured that students cared enough to protest the inequities, the injustices, and the corruption that any object person knows do exist in our social structure in America today. Obviously, Vietnam, the draft, the evils of racial discrimination and poverty were major fuels for the unrest. But beyond these, I felt there was a general lack of confidence in our social, political, and economic system, an uneasy feeling that our society was out of control, that it was drifting on collision course for a variety of reasons, and that the results were easily predictable. You will recall that Dr. George Wall, the Nobel laureate in his celebrated speech at MIT said, I think I know what is bothering the students. I think we're up against a generation that is by no means sure it has a future. Then people ask the questions, what comes after the protests? Are these young people willing to work with equal enthusiasm to make the changes in our society that we admit are needed? Are they willing to extend their interest to other priority goals, along with the war and with civil rights? In my opinion, you have supplied the answer to these questions in this massive and this united effort to arouse the nation to the rescue of our environment. It has been suggested by some that the espousal of the environment as a cause is simply a middle-class cop-out 
for the seamy issues of race and poverty, and that it is like coming out for motherhood under the right circumstances. Now this is a possibility that concerned me too. And frankly, I believe that some of the current partisans of the ecological issue are embracing it for this very reason. And I wouldn't mislead you on that. But I am convinced that the vast majority are entirely sincere in their involvement and that they see the environment as one essential part of the vital, total context of our national priorities. They are no less interested in the great issues of peace, of poverty, and of civil rights because of their concern about the environment. These are critical, but they are related issues. As I see it, the city's slums and impoverished rural areas are part of our general concern for the environment. There is a correlation between polluting our society with a psychology of brutality and racial discrimination and chemically polluting the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the land we live on and I might add, polluting our own bodies and minds as well. It should be pointed out that the environment will not be a non-controversial issue indefinitely. For the time being, it is. I know of no political animal in America that's against doing something about pollution today. It is non-controversial just as long as the economic self-interest group think it is just talk and that you don't really mean business. <laughs> but if they find out that it isn't a fad and that perhaps you really do mean business, then it becomes as controversial in some quarters as Vietnam does in others. A straw in the wind may be seen in the campaign GM project, an effort to reshape the corporate policies of the General Motors Corporation from within through the representations of minority stockholders. The objective of the campaign is to reform the giant corporation and to persuade it to take greater responsibility for solving problems of auto pollution, auto safety, and equal employment opportunities. Of nine resolutions recommended by stockholders representing campaign GM, the Securities and Exchange Commission has ordered the company to include two on the annual meeting agenda in May. One would establish a permanent committee on corporate responsibility to evaluate past GM decisions on such problems as pollution, vehicle safety, and to recommend future action. The other resolution would add three representatives of the public to the board of directors. In the event this resolution should pass, campaign GM has nominated Betty Furness, former presidential assistant on consumer affairs, Renee, Renee Du Bois, a biologist and environmental expert, and the Reverend Channing Phillips, a prominent black leader in Washington, D.C. Whatever may come of campaign GM, it must be regarded as a courageous and imaginative effort to break new ground for effective pollution control. Now, while every individual in America shares some responsibility for the pollution and destruction of our environment, there is no escaping the fact that industry is the major contributor well, it is generally agreed by scientists and other experts on the environment that time is running out. And the most credible estimates of how long we can last on our present course vary from a few years to no more than a generation at most. Now, some experts believe we can handle the problem by making adjustments within our present political, social, and economic systems. Others believe the drastic overhauling of those systems 
based on change in the underlying values is absolutely necessary. They believe something fundamental must be done to curb the passion for profit and the tunnel visioned preoccupation with economic growth over all other considerations. Now, I regard the rescue of our environment as typical of the other major problems that face the nation. The difficulties are compounding more swiftly than our remedies are moving to meet them. And the backlog from past neglect is staggering. Now, all this adds up to the fact that the old policies, the traditional guidelines, will not suffice for the 70s. It will require more than a little facelifting to make them work. What is required is change. And not superficial change, but real major surgery. The old concepts of unlimited creature comforts for every individual citizen, of uninhibited corporate profits, and of politics as usual must be drastically revised. Now, realistically, what we are talking about is a revolution of values and a revolution of attitudes. And we will have to sacrifice to an extent that will be highly distasteful to all of us in order to obtain a common goal, survival. It will require laws of unprecedented potence, laws applying to individual citizens, political subdivisions, and to corporations. It will require a massive outlay of public funds, perhaps 10 times what any budget has thus far offered. If we are to even dent the problems of controlling pollution and of preserving this environment. And I can assure you the taxpayers will say we can't afford it. And for the moment, I wouldn't even argue that point. I just ask you to consider the alternatives. We are spending far greater sums on the ever escalating buildup of our military establishment and particularly on our expanding military involvement in Indochina than anything we have ever considered in these lines. The environment is no less a survival issue. The change in our society that I'm talking about would be a revolution of values regarding the environment and our other national priorities. It would be a non-violent revolution, but nonetheless as basic and far-reaching in its effects as any revolution. It is, I'm convinced, essential to make our institutions and our policies responsive before violence prevails and to fight a rearguard action against critically needed change would be the greatest folly of all. As John Kennedy put it, Years ago, those who make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. Now, we, like our forebears, have grown up to the themes conquer nature, tame the wilderness, harness the rivers. We vitalized progress and defined it largely in quantitative terms, economic growth, population growth, and the exploitive development of our natural resources. And now we must make some fundamental changes in our viewpoint. It will not be easy. And those who tell us we can have our cake and eat it, that we can preserve our environment while polluting and plundering it, will have to be out-debated and out-voted. It won't be easy at all. It would be nice to wake up some morning to discover that the Santa Barbara tragedies and the death of Lake Erie, the thousands of acres of abandoned strip vines and the poisonous smog of our cities, the junk jungles, the ghettos, the reeking rivers and the plundered timberlands were all a bad dream. And it never really happened. But they have happened, and they are only portents of greater disasters to come if action is not taken. Now, without pointing a finger of blame at any individual or group, for that matter, for what has happened, 
As has often been said, we all share the responsibility. The administration and the Congress under both great political parties, state and local government leaders under both political parties, businessmen, farmers, individual citizens everywhere share in the responsibility. Now, to reverse the deeply impacted trend of carelessness, and exploitive technology seems, when you look at all of the facts, almost mission impossible. And yet I believe it is within our reach, but not without pain, and certainly not overnight, but yet long before it is too late, for the simple reason that we have no other rational choice. If reason and public concern are not sufficient to motivate us, the instinct of self-preservation should supply the necessary ingredient. It is not altogether certain that the damage to our earthly habitat from a blind technology can be overcome by a sighted technology, but it can go a long, long way. So let's not waste the time wondering whether or not we have the technological expertise or the governing skills to save our biosphere. It is not the technology of restoration or the method of abatement that is in question. These can be provided without a doubt. We can alleviate the misery of the cities if we apply ourselves to it. We could save what is left of open spaces and open rivers if we are determined to do it. We can slow down the population growth. We can control the various kinds of pollution including thermal and noise pollution. And we can develop ways of disposing of or of utilizing the solid waste that threaten to bury us, if we have the will to do so. Of these can be alleviated, but they cannot be done simply by tightening your belt and saying we will hold the line we cannot afford to meet the problems of this country or the challenges of our age. And when all the polite phrases have been spoken and the neat neuter plans have been unveiled, it is our commitment that will finally tell the story. And when I say commitment, I mean moral and financial commitment, for both are essential. Laws without teeth are useless, and laws with teeth are useless if administered with favoritism and with exceptions and with easy outs for those who know the right people or make the right financial commitments under the right circumstances. We need a moral commitment. Furthermore, if we're to save our environment, and to still meet the other ranking problems that threaten to pull our domestic society apart at the seams, we need to put the cold cash behind our moral commitment before it is too late. Now, money won't solve all such problems. It is often said by those public officials who get elected by the gutless refusal to support the funding of essential human problems that money won't solve the problems. Now, when I talk about funding in this reference, I'm talking about investing to save our future, not about lavish expenditure of public funds, but however it is phrased, I'm talking about meeting the needs with money. And that's the only way they will be met at a public level. I think when we talk about this moral commitment, we must look at the total moral commitment of this nation, the commitment of where we have been and where we are going, the commitment of where our policies are taking us in this country today. You talk about the 70s and what we can do to save our biosphere in the years that lie ahead of us in this decade. And the concerns are so great and so many that many seem to be almost totally radicalized from any acceptance 
of what is taking place in the public arena today. No belief in the systems at all, and little in any individual across the length and breadth of this land. So when we talk about a great and outstanding commitment against pollution and biospheric destruction and saving this globe that we live on, this spaceship that we travel together as fellow passengers, then I think we must understand that our commitment as a nation goes even beyond that. I would call your attention to the fact that we are changing drastically the ecology of Southeast Asia. I would call attention to the fact that our use of chemicals in warfare has brought about a response from peoples around the world that has been unbelievable. That mass population migrations in this country over a period of years without anything done to deter the migrations. It's not isolated the United States, it's worldwide, but we have the opportunity to do something here, and we didn't. And now the people ask, why are the center cores of our cities rotting? Can we spend hundreds of millions of dollars in saving the hardcore rotting center city in America today? And the question is raised in everyone's mind as to whether it's even possible at all anymore. If we're to save the biosphere, it means we have to save those people who are committing themselves hopefully and compassionately to the well-being of humanity to do so. There are many questions raised about priorities. One of the first I was asked this evening, what do you think we should do in the way of national priorities? I'm having a difficult time speaking to you tonight in all honesty because I can't separate biospheric pollution from war. And I'm having a I'll tell you the truth, I'm getting damn tired of receiving invitations to campuses around the country and saying, don't be partisan in what you talk about. I don't... If I'm partisan on behalf of humanity, I hope it's forgivable. And that's what I'm speaking about. I'm not speaking against any individual or for any individual. I'm saying that the simple fact is that we have not yet recognized the individual value and dignity of a human life. And until we, until we accept that fact, and the fact that human life has dignity, what sense is there to pollution or saving ourselves from it? And until we understand the fact that a yellow life has as much value as a white one, or a brown one, or a red one, or a black one, and that bullets and bombs pollute more than anything I know, I don't know how we can orient the priorities of this country to keeping sewage out of our rivers. We are faced daily with an ever-widening international perspective and a question of priorities, and everyone now says we need new priorities in America. And yet most of the commitments that we are making, this nation is oriented to death rather than to life. We have not so ordained yet that man shall live as a common goal of this country, in my opinion because we can spend hundreds of millions and billions in systems of weapons that can destroy humanity. 
in a world that, and a nation that already has the capability of turning the earth into a cinder within 30 minutes and refining the dust to a depth of 30 feet. Now, what the hell kind of pollution is that in, uh, in what we are talking about? As long as we live in this shadow of continuing the debate of a defense system of weapons to protect our offensive weapons, which we are already testing, and I won't belabor this point very long, but it is a matter of priority with biospheric destruction, of merving those weapons. Merving means, as most of you know, placing up to 10 warheads on one missile that can be aimed separately like a rifle at 10 different points on the face of the earth. And with multiple forces of, su of submarines, with multiple missiles carrying mul multiple warheads, with 600 manned bombers, and intercontinental ICBMs placed all over the country and scattered around the world, with our technology and advanced in chemical warfare and gas warfare beyond the understanding of most human beings in the world today. And the expenditure of, it's estimated over the course of the last three years, $30 billion a year in Southeast Asia, that's now been reduced to around 20, I understand. A continuing commitment that keeps us far in excess of $100 billion. The President has estimated that we should spend $10 billion in this decade for pollution. I chair a subcommittee on narcotics addiction, drug dependence, and alcoholism in America. The latest estimates given to me are that there are between 12 and 20 million users of marijuana in the United States. Hundreds of thousands using heroin and growing every day. Millions using the hallucinogens, the amphetamines, the barbiturates, the uppers and downers, and all the rest. 80 million Americans drinking alcohol. And we are an intoxicated society. We get up in the morning, we drink caffeine in our coffee before we can speak to our wives. We have nicotine in our cigarettes to pollute our lungs. We take an amphetamine to lift us up for the day, two martinis before lunch, a tranquilizer for the afternoon, three highballs before dinner, a sleeping pill to get through the night. If we're too fat, we take a pill to lose weight. If we're too light, we take one to gain it. If we've got a real problem, we run to the booze cabinet and pour a water glass full of whiskey in the interim. That's a kind of pollution I believe in also the pollution of the human spirit. It's a pollution of the human spirit and a destruction of the will of mankind to face his God-given abundance that we have with reality. Now let's balance this ledger of what we can do in this decade. You know, I'm reminded somewhat as though the Creator or Cosmic Consciousness or whatever you call the Supreme Being has drawn together in this country what I would call from the old book, God's Little Acre. And he took all the peoples of the earth, the black, the white, the red, the brown, and he put them together here. And he said, I'm going to give them everything we have in all of creation and see what they can do with it. So he gave us the greatest food and fiber producing capability ever known in the history of mankind, the greatest technology ever developed by any segment of humanity, the greatest scientific capability ever devised in anyone's wildest imagination, the greatest educational systems ever spread on the face of the earth, the greatest affluence collectively and individually ever known to any segment of mankind. And what have we done with it? 23 million blacks cannot find rights in this free country. 90 miles off our shore, we do nothing to guarantee the voting rights of a people who have been taken over by a dictator. 
while 12,000 miles away, we guarantee the individual rights of 16 million people at the expense of 40 million American, or 40,000 American lives and 265,000 wounded and other millions injured and dead on the other side. My whole point in bringing these subjects up is the fact that when you talk about priorities, and law and order is the boom of the day, along with ecology, it's the popular thing to talk about. There is a world court made up of 15 judges, only two of whom are communist. In over a decade, we have not asked for an opinion from the world court to settle any world differences. And we have little utilized the international prestige that we have had to ask for decisions from these high authorities. So as we move on a system of priorities and realize that it's going to take a vast expenditure and a vast commitment in what is truly and honest and rightful areas to end man's destruction of himself by pollution, by misuse and misunderstanding of chemicals, by systems that destroy that which we have and with when we have all the technology that we need to correct it. The only question that can remain is do we have the will to commit ourselves to make those corrections and I believe we do have in this country. I believe you have. <laughs> Money won't solve all these problems, ladies and gentlemen. Perhaps we should set aside or postpone the supersonic transport. Perhaps we should reconsider the decision of the ABM. And perhaps we should use the legal devices internationally that are open to this country to avoid the vast expenditures and losses of human life and commitments of resources that are unnecessary. Perhaps even the wounded Iowa combat soldier in Vietnam was right when he said, there isn't anything over here that is worth the life of one GI. <laughs> it is a matter of priorities. It is a matter of urgency. It's a matter of life and death. The transport will wait the environment won't. We have the courage, we've proven that. We have the compassion if we apply it. We have the common sense, the technology, the scientific capability. And ladies and gentlemen, we also have the money. You look around affluent America today and say that we can't afford to do this. I can't believe it. Otherwise, when the time comes, according to the scriptural prophecy, that the meek shall inherit the earth, I doubt whether they would want it. <laughs> and I'm sure they'd never be in a position to accept it if we were to continue existing policies. So I think for this decade of the 70s that the commitment that is necessary is the full understanding that we have all the essential tools. We have all the capabilities. The only thing that could be lacking in this country today to meet the needs that we have is the personal commitment individually and the collective commitment internally. The unity of will and the unity of spirit. To dedicate ourselves to meet these goals head on, controversial though they may be. This is a popular week. The going will get tough. I can point to plants in this area 30 miles away that have had legal orders brought against them once every three years for the last 10 years. And nothing has happened yet. 
If the government had any intentions of doing anything, if the federal system said we will never buy another automobile that isn't a low emission vehicle, and we'll give you 18 months to change every manufacturer of automobiles in this country, would meet the deadline. Because if the federal, <laughs> if federal, state, and local governments refuse to buy, the deadlines would be met. The airlines will meet theirs. We know scientifically how to loop the systems of industrial waste and recover and save. You've been told all those things, or you will be in the following weeks. The technology of population control is with us. But the changing of attitudes and the changing of heritage is a more difficult problem. And we can and we will even do that with the proper leadership and the proper dedication. The only thing I can say in conclusion is that this is the love in. This is the joyous week where all the people bipartisanly go out and talk, you know, about the greatness of saving the biosphere from pollution. A week after next, it will be a little more difficult. Next year, a little more than that. And if we do turn some of these corners a couple of years from now is when the fighting will get real tough. And I hope I'll see every one of you there committed at that time. Thank you for the opportunity to join you this evening. Don't forget the reception right across Lincoln Way in the Maple Willow Commons.